thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Avril, and it's always lovely to, <laughs> to meet you and do things with you. And thanks, Noreen, that was such a brilliant talk. And I think we were all very, it was a real motivator, um, to be honest, to, to, to keep going. Um, so, yep, my name is Clee and I work clinically with people who are socially excluded and David did a brilliant job already of covers lots of things that I was going to cover, so it's brilliant. Um, and I always feel I work in an evidence-free zone. Um, so, you know, it's so brilliant. You can see what that research evidence has been able to deliver for your children. It's just wonderful. Um, but the people that I work with, usually there's no evidence on how best to treat them and how to look after them. And so that's why I have a traveling circus going around giving talks uh, to, to really highlight and try and give them a bit of a voice. So I'm going to talk about people who are socially excluded and David already alluded to this in his talk so that's brilliant um, but really what we're looking at is people who have usually more than one of these things and I love I, I don't know why we all think that somebody can just have one thing like they can be a woman or they can be black or they can be gay or they can be poor and um, when actually most things tend to tend to run together so all of these aspects of people's lives um, tend to be studied as separate things and that's one of the problem with the research in the areas so prisoners are studied over here and people with addiction are over there and travelers are over here and actually if you look at those experiences they tend to be the same people who are having to to cope with all of those things so basically what you can do conceptually is say those are socially excluded people they're people who are excluded from housing so if you look at who's homeless it's the same people who are excluded from housing they're excluded from education very few of them will have third level or even second level education it was lovely to see Fidelma allude to that in her talk um, they're excluded excluded from voting, most of them aren't registered to vote, so they're the same people who are left out at all stages of their life, including when they're children and pregnant women um, and, and uh, uh, when their health is bad. And it's really, really, really important to research this because we don't understand it. So I'm trained as an infectious diseases doctor. I have the privilege of looking after people with HIV. We have amazing medicines for HIV. Somebody comes to clinic and I can say, listen, you've got a diagnosis it's actually going to be grand. With the tablets we have nowadays, your life expectancy is normal. You don't need to use a condom unless you need to for other reasons. You can have babies, you can do whatever job you want, you know, and, and be able to, to, to do that. It's just remarkable. Such a, and, and came about because of a lot of patient advocacy as well. But if we look at, and we understand how bacteria and viruses work and how they make people sick and how we need to treat them, but we don't understand social causes of ill health. So if you look at poverty, so living in a poor area, living in Ballymun in Dublin, compared to living in Ballsbridge, uh, which is much more affluent, you shave about five years off your life expectancy. Um, and that's the same in every rich country. It's the same in the UK, it's the same in Switzerland, it's the same everywhere. And at any given age, your chance of dying is twice as high if you live in a poor area. So if you're a 20-year-old living in Ballymun, your chance of dying in the next year is twice that of a 20-year-old in Balls Bridge. And it's the same if you're 90. Obviously, the risk of you dying in the next year is much higher if you're 90, but it's still twice as high if you're living in a poor area. And we understand as doctors, as scientists, as researchers, we understand about a third of what's causing that. So if you correct for smoking and diet and exercise and drink and drugs and all those other things that we understand, you're still about two thirds of that difference is unexplained. Like we're in the era where we didn't know that bacteria existed and we thought it was ill humours coming in from the graveyard. That's where we are in understanding this. And that's known as the slope index of inequality. But what I'm really interested in clinically and research-wise is people who experience the same thing but at a much higher intensity. So they are the people who are really left out, who are really marginalised. And they're the people who experience homelessness, prison, uh, drug use, uh, addiction, obesity, all the things that David talked about already. And when you look at that as a phenomenon, when you understand that those are actually the same people having those experiences, you can do this type of research where you can see that the chance of dying as a man who's socially excluded at any given age is eight times higher, and the chance of dying as a socially excluded woman is 12 times higher. So the average age of death for a homeless man in Dublin, homeless single man, is 44 years of age, and the average age of death for a homeless single woman in Dublin is 38. And women do even worse in social exclusion than men. So really need to not exclude women from this research either. And we don't understand this. We don't know what's going on. There's no research, there's no evidence um, for this huge health problem. And it's right through the life course. So it's important in pregnancy where women who are socially excluded will have more premature births, more maternal complications, more small for dates babies. And it goes right through to that early aging and death that I was delighted that David alluded to. 
key part of it is experiences that happen in childhood. So childhood is so important, and I'm a parent as well. It's so much work being a parent, yeah? Like, it's massive. I don't know how you do it with four. I only have two. But it's a really, really sensitive time of people's development of how they see themselves and how they expect the world to treat them. And one of the ways of studying that is looking at these adverse childhood experiences. There are 12 different ones um, being subject to physical, sexual or emotional abuse, being neglected, having a parent who's in prison, having domestic violence going on in the home. All of these things really mark your sense of safety in the world, your sense of how you can expect people to treat you, your sense of self-worth. And if you look in populations that are socially excluded, 80% or more will have had five or more of these adverse childhood experiences. And that's why it's really important to specifically think about them when we're doing research, because their experience of life has been really profoundly changed by having to go through these things. And if we aren't conscious of that in research, we won't be able to reach these groups. So this is one way of thinking about it. Um, and I was thinking about this in clinic yesterday. I saw a woman who's had all of those adverse childhood experiences is trying to keep her life going. She's now in a council flat. And it's so, the water is pouring down the walls. It's really moldy. Um, she's having to burn her furniture to keep warm because it's so poorly insulated that she can't do it. And so that's why I love this concept of structural violence. I wish it didn't happen, but you can see it all the time. So by leaving people out of, of things, by not considering those who have the least, we're actually causing a huge amount of preventable suffering. And it's the same person who experiences it again and again, unfortunately. So in order to, to come to equity, to fairness, which David was talking about, that ethos of fairness, we need different people are going to need different things. So like you were saying, Fidelma, some people just need longer for the consent process. So that's fine. You build that in. Some people mightn't be able to read the leaflet. That's fine. You build in that if you need translator, if you need somebody to read it through to you, that you can do that to make sure that everybody gets to take part. Um, this was just about uh, sickness. This is some really interesting work from, from animal models looking at how adversity and social stress affect biology. So this is another thing that we don't understand. So how do we go about including these people in research? So they're really sick. They have problems that we don't understand, and we have no evidence. So we need to do something. It's not OK to say, it's too difficult. Asher, we'll leave them out. We'll leave the children out. It's too difficult for the ethics committee. Um, so we need to recognize that one size doesn't fit all. So you need to be able to adapt to what you're doing. It's not rocket science. You just need to be a bit thoughtful. Um, you need to question that deserveometer. So this is a really, really big one. I, this is not a real device. You cannot buy it on Amazon. <laughs> Um, although you see it in use all the time, and it's about who deserves what. And sometimes it's easier to argue for children who are socially excluded, for example, for traveling children, because most people think that children deserve the best that we can all give them, and, and I would agree there. But we need to question that. So when people are left out, it's because on some level, conscious or unconscious, we don't think they deserve the same as everybody else. Um, and how, what, what helps? So I think just really taking the fear factor out of it. You know, it's not that difficult. It's just about being practical. I think I was saying this last time we met Avril, I was working with the HSE on a project and they spent three months, three people spent three months trying to think about how would you ask patients if they were homeless? And that was great and they were working really hard. And I said to them, um, lads, have you asked anybody who's homeless how they prefer to be asked? And they were like, no. And I was like, well, here's somebody, ask them. And uh, the answer was, it's fine to just ask us if we're homeless. You know, so don't overcomplicate it sometimes. Just ask somebody from those groups um, and, and be aware of what you're doing. You know, just, just be conscious of it and talk. I think, you know, the trust that has been lost by people with their early life experiences can be rebuilt, as you said, Fadama, with that sense of care and attention and, and the human factor. Um, and there are lots of things that you can look at in your research. So childcare, big thing for women taking part in research, particularly women who may be less affluent or not have family living nearby, is childcare. So maybe something like having a creche on site if you're doing research or some kind of way that women can drop their children there. Making sure that you consider the physical space you're doing it. So I think hospitals are lovely welcoming places because I work there and it's where I go to hang out with my friends. But not the case for anybody. So maybe if you're working with a socially excluded group, you might need to take the research to them rather than the other way around, or do it in a GP practice in their community or a community center. Um, and just being really conscious about the wording that you use and, and about literacy. So the groups that we work with, about 80% are functionally illiterate. So I love our clinic is covered in leaflets, but nobody can, well, my patients can't read. It's like, they're nice for decoration. But anyway. 
Um, and it's really, really important. So I think David really highlighted it. If we don't include these groups in research, we don't get the evidence that is needed, and we don't get a true reflection of what is going on. So it's so important. I'm involved in the National COVID Biobank, as is Suzanne and Evelyn, who are here. And we've put a lot of effort into making sure that we have people who are homeless, we have people who are, have experienced prison, we have people who need translators in the biobank. So you need to include them, and you need to measure those experiences. So rather than going, oh, that's a really sensitive question, and I won't ask it, you're much better at asking in, you know, when you've asked people who have those experiences if it's okay, to say, have a question saying, we know that poverty and stress affect your response to COVID. Is it okay if we ask you, have you ever been homeless in prison? Have you ever been addicted to drugs? So that we have that information, because if you don't have the information, you can't find what you need to find. Um, and, and there's lots of great models. So really, that's it. Thanks a million, Avril. I think that was my last slide.